Hello everyone, this is Dr. Singaram, your pediatrics faculty at Maro. In this session, I will be discussing about the recall questions in pediatrics from the recently conducted INICT exam. In this exam, we had around 10 questions in pediatrics from the usual or expected topics like neonatal resuscitation, cystic fibrosis and there were few questions uh, from new topics as well. I will start with the first question about NADA's minor criteria. It is a multiple option type question where you have to choose or what is all applicable for NADA's minor criteria. Now, before I go to the discussion of this question, let me tell you what is NADA's criteria. It is a criteria which is useful in the clinical diagnosis of congenital heart disease. So, based on some clinical findings, we think about the possibility of congenital heart disease with the NADA's criteria. And NADA's criteria just like any other clinical criteria has major criteria and minor criteria. Major criteria include systolic murmur grade 3 or more, any diastolic murmur, presence of cyanosis, of course, central cyanosis and features of congestive heart failure. These are all the major criteria. Minor criteria include systolic murmur of less than grade 3, abnormal heart sounds, ab that is abnormal second heart sound, abnormal blood pressure, abnormal x-ray or abnormal ECG. All these are minor criteria. And please remember, to make a clinical diagnosis of congenital heart disease, you should have at least one major criteria or two minor criteria are essential for indicating the presence of congenital heart disease. Now, if this is satisfied, then you have to go for the next investigation. What is the next investigation? That is echocardiography, which would be the final investigation for diagnosis of congenital heart disease. So, that is about the NADA's criteria in brief. Now, I take you back to the question. This is about minor criteria. Look at the first option. Systolic murmur grade 3 is a major criteria. Diastolic murmur again is a major criteria. Abnormal second heart sound is a minor criteria. Abnormal BP is also a minor criteria. So, the answer for this question will be option number C which includes 3 and 4 which are the NADA's minor criteria. Moving on to the second question, an 18 month old child with a 3 day history of watery diarrhea and vomiting presented with altered sensorium, which of the following are the differential diagnosis? So, we have a setting of a child with acute watery diarrhea and having altered sensorium. So, four things are given. You have to think about what are all the possibilities and you have to choose your answer accordingly. First one, can it be severe dehydration? Absolutely possible because we know the characteristic uh, feature of severe dehydration is a child who is having extreme letharginess or having altered sensorium also. Along with that, child will not accept anything orally. So, severe dehydration is possible in this clinical setting. Next one is about HUS or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Please remember, hemolytic uremic syndrome is not a possibility here or very unlikely possibility here because this is not something which occurs with the diarrhea. It is post gastroenteritis or a post diarrheal condition. Okay? Usually, it occurs 5 to 10 days after the occurrence of diarrhea. Not only that, it is not usually watery diarrhea. It is usually in the setting of dysentery or blood in stools, bloody diarrhea. Okay, right? So, both those are not satisfied. So, I will not think about the possibility of HUS in this particular setting. Cerebral venous thrombosis definitely can be associated with altered sensorium. It can be associated with seizures as, seizures as well. And the reason for thrombosis is basically due to dehydration, severe dehydration which can be associated with thrombosis and altered sensorium in this child. Hyponatremia, of course, is a possibility. It can also be associated with altered sensorium and diarrhea. So, what would be the best option to choose? It would be 1, 3 and 4, which corresponds to option number C. Okay, right. So, whenever you have a child who is having diarrhea, along with that child is having altered sensorium or seizures, please keep these conditions as differentials in your mind. Number one would be the electrolyte abnormality, which could be hyponatremia usually or hypernatremia as well. That is something which you have to remember. Next would be low sugars or hypoglycemia. Third would be presence of encephalitis or meningitis. In this situation, child would have signs of meningeal irritation. Uh, if it is a case of meningitis along with the fever also, child will have this findings. Number four would be presence of febrile seizures. Okay, That can also present with seizures. Uh, in a child with a diarrhea and last one would be 
cerebral or sagittal sinus thrombosis which is due to severe dehydration thrombosis develops in the cerebral region okay these are all the possibilities whenever you have a child with a diarrhea and having altered sensory more seizures moving on to the question number three the causative agent of this condition is associated with which of the following disorders gingivostomatitis pure red cell aplasia molluscum contagiosum and kaposi sarcoma first of all you have to identify what is the condition then you have to identify what is the etiological agent and then you have to identify that etiological agent can be associated with which of the condition given in the option first thing the characteristic appearance what is that you see intense redness of the cheeks what is that it is nothing but slabbed cheek appearance it's a very characteristic finding in which disorder yes it is erythema infectiosum erythema infectiosum caused by which agent or which um, organism it is parvovirus b19 infection okay right you should be knowing about this so now you have to correlate which disorder is this parvovirus b19 associated it is associated with pure red cell aplasia okay among the options given answer is option b and the reason why this parvovirus is associated with a pure red cell aplasia is because this parvovirus has got a tropism okay for this erythroid cells with the help of this antigen what is that erythrocyte p blood group antigen that is why it becomes a primary target for the parvovirus to affect the red cells and cause red cell aplasia okay right the other associations of this parvovirus which you should be knowing about are of course we were talking about erythema infectiosum or the fifth disease which is caused by parvovirus the associations include one is arthralgia or arthropathy which is more common older children or adolescents next a plastic crisis pure red cell aplasia this usually occurs in the setting of chronic hemolytic anemias chronic hemolytic anemias something like a child with a sickle cell anemia that child can develop pure red cell aplasia or a plastic crisis in pregnancy it is associated with hydrops fetalis there was one question related to this also which i'll be discussing little later related to pregnancy complications in parvovirus b19 infection last one would be about in an immunocompromised child it can be associated with hemo phagocytic syndromes hemophagocytic syndromes these are the characteristic associations of parvovirus b19 infection moving on to the next question which of the following has the least risk of perinatal transmission perinatal is something around the delivery time okay where it is transmitted by contact with the mother or through secretions in the mother or through the breastfeeding like that perinatal transmission okay right herpes simplex virus cytomegalovirus hepatitis b and rubella the first two option herpes simplex and cytomegalovirus can very well be transmitted by coming in contact with the infected vesicles of the mother it can be transmitted to the baby in the perinatal period so it is very well possible hepatitis b definitely is possible that is why we always try to prevent the perinatal transmission by giving hepatitis b vaccine as well as hepatitis b immunoglobulin as soon as possible after birth so that is golds also has got a perinatal transmission risk so the answer for this question is rubella rubella doesn't have a perinatal transmission rubella is more of what transmission intra uterine transmission and that too the risk is highest in the first trimester of pregnancy so rubella is a intra uterine transmission and not a perinatal transmission and hence the answer for this particular question moving on to the next question a 6 year old boy was bought with a history of chronic cough and foul smelling stools his sibling had similar complaints and died few years back whenever there is a family history of similar complaint it means it's a inherited condition sweat chloride and cftr gene studies are done so now the diagnosis is clear itself what is that in which condition do you do, do you do sweat chloride test and cftr it is nothing but cystic fibrosis correct cystic fibrosis is a repeatedly asked topic in almost every exam we get one question related to cystic fibrosis and cystic fibrosis is a condition which is characterized by recurrent pneumonia which can manifest as chronic cough 
It is also associated with malabsorption, especially steatoria that can present as foul smelling stools as well. Okay, so clinical features are also correlating with the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Now the question is, CFTR gene codes for the proteins which are involved in the transport of which ion? Basically, CFTR codes for the CFTR protein which is nothing but an ion channel. Which ion channel it is? It is nothing but chloride ion channel, Cl minus, chloride ion channel. Okay, some of the important points to be noted are, it is inherited as which mode of inheritance? Autosomal, recessive mode of inheritance, that is an important point to be noted. Next thing, there are so many mutations in CFTR gene and the most common mutation. This has also been asked in one of the recent exams as well. What is that? Delta F508. What is that? It is deletion of phenylalanine at the 508 position of the amino acid chain. Okay, these are some of the important questions which have been previously asked in the section of cystic fibrosis. And also, you should know about the criteria for diagnosis of cystic fibrosis based on the investigation. Remember, you should have two elevated sweat chloride values which will be more than 60 milli equivalents per liter or identification of not just one CFTR mutation, two CFTR mutation that is something which is important and third one an abnormal nasal potential difference measurement. It is also called trans epithelial nasal potential difference even a single abnormal value can help in your diagnosis. Okay, And out of these different tests, if they ask you which is the overall best test for diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, your answer has to be yes of course, detection of gene mutation. This is the overall best test for diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Okay, right. Moving on to the next question, a 4 year old boy presented with a history of fever, congenital congestion and erythematous desquamation of skin two dimensional echocardiography i will do this question again okay moving on to the next question a 4 year old boy presented with a history of fever congenital congestion and erythematous desquamation of the skin 2d echo shows coronary aneurysms and many students recall that there were so many images given in the question something related to strawberry tongue was given and few mentioned that uh, the uh, the skin desquamation also was given in the question what should be the first line treatment of this particular condition. Okay. See, when you have a history which is very classical along with the features, you should think about which diagnosis, especially coronary aneurysm and all is given in the echocardiography finding. It is going to be a case of Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease. And for Kawasaki disease, what should be the first line treatment? Is it aspirin, clopidogrel, IVIG or low molecular weight heparin? It is obviously IVIG which will be the first line treatment. Okay, IVIG is usually given in the dose of 2 grams per kg which is the treatment of choice in this particular condition. Of course, we do use aspirin also for its anti-inflammatory effect. However, it is not a first choice. First choice is always always IVIG. Just a quick note about Kawasaki disease. Remember the typical feature of Kawasaki disease is fever and it is a long duration fever more than or equal to 5 days of fever. At least 5 days of fever is required, not just 1 or 2 days. And along with the fever, you should have other criteria also, which are remembered by mnemonic call CREEN. C for conjunctivitis, they have usually bilateral conjunctivitis. R for the rash, it is a non-specific maclopapular rash. E for edema of the extremities. You can also get skin uh, desquamation of the skin area around the nail region. So, I am going to write periangual desquamation, periangual surrounding the finger nails, you have a desquamation. Then A for adenopathy, lymphadenopathy, usually it is a cervical lymphadenopathy. Last one M for the mucosal changes in the oral cavity, typically strawberry tongue. And for you to make a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease, fever should be present. Along with the fever, 4 out of 5 other findings should be present. Other findings, I have told you the mnemonic is cream. So, there are 5 other findings. Out of that 5, 4 should be present. Or you should have a suggestive echocardiography. In this question, you saw that fever was given. Along with that, 
other findings also were given and along with that even echo showed coronary aneurysm. So, definitely beyond doubt in this question it is a case of Kawasaki disease and the treatment for that is IVIG. Moving on to next question which is about neonatal resuscitation. This is regarding a baby born by meconium stain liquor which of the following are recommended as per the neonatal resuscitation guidelines. Okay? So, you have to choose all the correct statements again. Before we go to the discussion of the question, let me briefly tell you about the meconium stain liquor. A baby born through meconium stain liquor, we divide these babies into two groups. One is non-vigorous baby and other one is a vigorous baby. Vigorous baby basically has a good breathing or it is crying well as well as the tone is normal. Whereas in a non-vigorous baby, there is poor breathing or no breathing at all as well as the baby is having a decreased tone. This is the basic category of babies born by meconium stain liquor. Guidelines suggest that if it is a vigorous baby, you have to do a gentle suction of the mouth and nose and keep the baby with the mother. That is all. Nothing else is required. Whereas, if it is a non-vigorous baby, obviously resuscitation will be required as with the usual flow of resuscitation, we will start with the initial steps of resuscitation, initial steps of resuscitation, which includes our usual things like positioning, suctioning as well as stimulation and keeping the baby under warmer. These will be the initial things to do if the baby is not breathing and born by meconium stain liquor. Of course, you have to start PPV if the baby is not responding to the initial steps. And a very, very important point is routine tracheal suctioning after birth in these babies is not recommended. Routine tracheal suction is not recommended in non-vigorous babies. So, these are the guidelines for a baby born through meconium stain liquor. Now, if you go back to the question, identify the true statement. Intrapartum suction of the nose and mouth before delivery of the shoulder. This is never recommended, not only for meconium stain liquor, any baby Intrapartum suctioning is not at all recommended as per the neonatal resuscitation guidelines. Intratracheal suction in case of non-vigorous baby, I just told you there is no need for routine intratracheal suctioning. Okay, no need. That's also a wrong statement. Gentle suction of the nose and mouth in case of vigorous baby, that's a true statement. Posture pressure ventilation in case of non-vigorous baby after the early steps or the initial steps, that is also true statement. So, what should be the answer? It should be option D, which includes 3 and 4 statement which are the correct statements for a baby born by meconium stain liquor. Moving on to the next question, the perinatal transmission of an infection shows the spectrum of anemia, possibly myocarditis, high output cardiac failure and ascites. A picture similar to this was also given in the exam telling that these are the areas which are affected like the bone, liver as well as the heart and the baby is fully swollen or what we call hydrops fetalis identify the causative agent. Parvirus B19, cytomegalovirus, trypanema pallidum, toxoplasma, gondi. Okay, right? So, you have to choose a condition which will have all these features. Let us go by the options one by one from the last. Toxoplasma gondi is an intrauterine infection coming under the torch category and this is characterized by what all findings? Microcephaly, rarely hydrocephalus also but usually microcephaly as well as diffuse calcifications inside the brain. So, that is not the picture given in the question, so that is out. Trypanema pallidum or the syphilis infections which is usually characterized by intense inflammation, okay, characterized by persistent rhinorrhea, inflammation in the bone causing uh, intense pain in the bone, so the baby will not be moving the limbs, those type of presentation. Along with that, you also have a vesicular rash. That is not the picture given in the question, so that is also out. Cytomegalovirus, cytomegalovirus again is an intrauterine infection which is characterized by microcephaly as well as characteristically what type of calcification in the brain? Periventricular calcifications, correct? Periventricular calcification, which is again not given in the question, so it is not CMV. So, the answer is going to be parvovirus. B19 infection which typically causes this type of presentation and one, one very very important clue in this particular question is hydrops fetalis which we always associated with parvovirus B19 infection if it occurs in the pregnancy. Now, 
whenever infection occurs in the fetus, please remember there are cytopathic effects which are primarily seen in the erythroblast. Okay? So, it is a condition which usually affects the erythropoiesis and I have already given you the reason before that it has got a selective affinity to the erythrocyte antigens. That is why it affects the erythroblast or erythropoiesis. Remember, in a fetus, it is not only going to affect the bone marrow because in the early stages in a fetus, uh, hematopoiesis also occurs in the liver. So, that is why if you go back to the picture, can you see in addition to the bone marrow, liver is also affected because in the early stages in the fetus, liver also takes part in the erythropoiesis. Okay. So, what is the initial effect? It is going to be resulting in anemia. It is going to be resulting in anemia, acute onset of anemia in the baby. Okay. Now, this anemia can sometimes resolve on its own or it can worsen. It can worsen causing what problem? It can cause cardiac failure as well as high drops fetalis. High drops fetalis. Are you able to follow this? Okay. There are other effects also noted by this parovirus B19 infection in the fetus which is related to direct involvement of the myocardium by the virus itself and it can be associated with myocarditis as well as it can be associated with intrauterine death. This is basically due to sudden cardiac arrest occurring in the fetus itself. Okay. These are the different effects of parovirus B19 infection if it occurs in the fetus during the intrauterine life. Moving on to the next question, it is something like a match the following type question where one side some statements are given, other side some disorders name are given. Trisomy 18, what is that? This is a very straightforward and a simple question. Trisomy 18 is a Edward syndrome. Trisomy 13 is Patau syndrome. Trinucleotide repeats, is it sickle cell anemia or Huntington disease? Obviously, it is Huntington disease and you should know what is the name of the trinucleotide repeat? It is CAG repeat. Sixth position of the hemoglobin chain where glutamate is replaced by valine that is very typical of sickle cell anemia. So, multiple options were given. You should choose the option which looks like this 1 B 2 C 3 D and 4 A. This would be the answer for this particular question, a pretty straightforward question. One more straightforward question, Pompe's disease is due to the deficiency of, you all know Pompe's disease is one of the glycogen storage disorder and that too muscle glycogen storage disorder which is coming under type 2 muscle glycogen storage disorder. Okay. You have to identify which enzyme deficiency is associated with this condition. Is it alpha glucosidase, phosphofructokinase, myophosphorylase or glucose 6-phosphatase? Answer is alpha glucosidase. Okay, right? Now, please remember Pompe's disease is something which is very special because in the muscle glycogen storage disorder, it not only affects the skeletal muscles, it is also affecting the cardiac muscles also. Whereas, all the other muscle glycogen storage disorder, they only affect the skeletal muscle. Another important point in Pompe's disease is, this alpha glucosidase is an enzyme which is available for ERT. What is that? Enzyme replacement therapy is possible for Pompe's disease. All these are important questions related to Pompe's disease. Just for completion, let us quickly see what are the other enzymes related to. Phosphofructokinase deficiency is noted in Torrey's disease. That is also glycogen storage disorder, muscle glycogen storage disorder, which is type 7. Myophosphorylase or muscle phosphorylase is related to McArdle's disease, which is one more muscle glycogen storage disorder, but this is GSD, glycogen storage disorder, type 5. Glucose 6 phosphatase is something related to von Gehrke disease which is a liver glycogen storage disorder as well as the most common glycogen storage disorder. It is GSD type 1. Okay. So, these are some other enzymes which are given in the question which I wanted to make a note of. Okay. So, that is about the discussion of questions asked in the pediatric section of the in the recently conducted INACT exam. 
Thank you and all the best for